Suffer the Children by Adam Creed Read by Jonathan Oliver Monday Afternoon Staff raises his head as high as he can, sucks in the underground air. He is pushed from behind, and his chest rubs up against the head of a raven-haired woman as they shuffle toward the escalator. She curses in an eastern tongue, and he wants to apologise, but knows it isn't warranted, nor will it accomplish anything. Judgment is scheduled for 1400. He tries to push into the left-hand line, but there is no gap. A group of teenage malevolence jostles through against the flow, leaving a sweet pall of solvents. He holds his breath as he takes a half-step onto the moving escalator, waits, then breathes deep, and pictures Judge Burns. The events of the past two days in court. His nerves tighten, and staff tries to calm his rushing blood. He makes sure the case papers are wedged tight into the pit of his arm, and does up the collar of his shirt. The top button presses against his Adam's apple as he swallows. He tightens his tie right up. Staff says a silent mantra, reaffirms that this is what he chose for himself. This is my life. Be the best you can. This is my life. Be the best you can. He replays his responses to cross-examination from the morning and picks through Judge Burns' summing up for hints that the evidence they have garnered might prevail. He places a hand on his heart, feels the original of a secret witness statement in his breast pocket. The world comes down to meet him, it seems, and the ticket barriers appear. They form a line between him and the white daylight beyond. New cellars stand like bookends at the gateway to Chancery Lane. The line of people clatters like dominoes, and he has to shuffle forward with tiny steps, and the raven-haired woman curses again. His phone vibrates in his trouser pocket, and he fumbles for it, trying not to drop the pile of precious papers. By the time he manages to get the phone up to his ear, the ringing ceases. The screen shows Marie, the name of his sister. He knows it will be trouble, but also knows he has to focus on the job in hand. The screen tells him, too, that it is 13.56. He puts his ticket into the machine and goes through, holding a firm, straight line. The smells of drains and bodies and newsprint fade quickly. The sound of chatter and curses and dragged luggage softens as he walks out onto the pavement. The bright day blisters the backs of his eyes, and when he blinks, the arch silhouette of the tube entrance burns purple and yellow on his eyelids. Staff steps into the traffic, which is stood still, and weaves away towards the other side of the street, where there is more space. He feels a whisper of breeze on his face and looks down towards the law courts, the Thames beyond. The traffic shifts and right beside him a horn blares and as he skips quickly to the curbside, St Bride's peals the hour. He knows if he runs, he will sweat all afternoon. Staff wipes a palm down the thigh of his charcoal grey suit and looks up into Judge Burns's eyes. Burns shuffles the papers, narrows his eyes as if he's giving the sentencing serious consideration, but it is plain to staff that the decision is already made. The courtroom air is tight, and the trapped heat of summer stifles. Just a line of small, rectangular and reinforced windows pulled open three feet below the high ceiling. The jury and the press hold their breath. The defendant... Jadis Golding, 19, is Don of the Dalston E-Gang. He smirks, leaning against the dock rails with a pimp slouch. Yesterday, three members of Golding's E-Gang had been ejected from the court while Sohan Kelly had given his evidence. Blat, 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 they had shouted. You're dead, motherfucker! 
jabbing fingers at him, pointing imaginary glocks. You snitching bitch man, fucking grass, kissing white man's ass. Kelly had looked across to staff and then hung his head. The E-gang had turned their attentions from Sohan Kelly to staff, smiles on their faces, as if no law could touch them. Staff takes a deep breath, touches Sohan Kelly's original statement in his pocket. Trails of sweat run from behind each ear into his collar. He swallows, and the top button of his shirt presses against his throat. Judge Burns avoids the eyes of the defendant and his family as he speaks. Jadis Golding, says Burns, looking down, I sentence you to seven years. The family stands, raging. Golding's father spits towards the judge, then spits again at staff, hitting him on the shoulder. Today, Sohan Kelly is at home, preparing his flight into hiding. Staff had told him it was best if he didn't come into court, best if he kept his head down, maybe went to Mumbai to stay with friends on his mother's side. He said he couldn't get the visa. Staff's boss, Pennington, said he would sort it. Fucking kill you, Wagstaff, shouts Jadis Golding. You won't need to, shouts his father. Staff looks across at them. He is an officer of the law. What should he fear from people like this? He prays that Sohan Kelly is long gone, taking his dubious truth with him. As the afternoon draws to a close, Staff gets up from his worn leather captain's chair and runs a hand through his tousled hair. He should get a cut, but nowadays it pays not to look like a copper. He leans towards the fan and takes air on his face, summons thanks to whoever might be up there for another small victory of good over bad. A seven-year tariff for a small-time gangster who thought that pulling a gun on a post office manager could redesign his life for the better. The post office manager is a basket case now, having to sell his bad dream. Staff makes a pile of the witness statements, forensic reports and charge sheets. He takes Sohan Kelly's original statement, folded time and again, from the inside pocket of his jacket. He is considered ripping it up time and again, but slips it in with the rest of the papers and lifts the whole lot high, drops them on top of the filing cabinet. He wipes his unclean palms down over his hips and looks at the stack of papers, takes them down again. He removes Sohan Kelly's original statement and puts it back in his jacket pocket. He presses the intercom. You got a minute, Pulford? Be straight in, sir, comes the tinny reply. Staff opens his drawer and takes out the airline ticket. It's been a long time coming, but finally he's getting to meet Munoz. Tomorrow morning he'll be on flight 729 to Bilbao. It's well over three years since his last proper holiday, and the best part of three years since Sylvie. They were supposed to have gone to Corsica for two weeks. Staff had cancelled it, which he had done before, but he wouldn't be given the chance again. There's a knock at the door and staff calls, Come in! He closes his eyes, imagines a sea breeze sweeping across a Basque promenade, a week of no telephones. Off tomorrow, sir, says Pulford. Staff opens his eyes, sees his detective sergeant closing the door behind him. Pulford's suit is sharp and his hair is trim, glistening with fresh wax. When he enters the room, he brings a scent of freshness with him. He doesn't carry fat, and his face is unravaged, a tinge of redness in his cheeks. Of the two of them, Pulford seems more the part than his inspector. His time will come, thinks Staff. I'm afraid there's quite a bit of tidying up, Pulford. That's what I'm here for, sir. Is it the Golding case? Seven years, eh? That's a result. 
Staff thinks about what Golding and his father had threatened. He feels bad that he's happy to be heading for a foreign shore. He'll be out in three and a half, and his crew will still be at it while he's away. They'll put his share to one side for when he gets out. Life goes on. You told me to enjoy the successes when they come along. Well, you don't have to take your own advice, Sergeant, says Staff, breaking out into a laugh. Is that advice? says Pulford, trying to keep a straight face. They laugh together, and Staff sits back in the captain's chair, rocking. He points to the pile of paperwork. Let's just say I'm letting you bask in the success. You can think about it while you're writing that lot up. Staff slips the airline ticket into the empty inside pocket of his suit jacket. Good job you managed to get a statement out of that Kelly guy. Get him to testify. Well, that smart-ass barrister of Golding's might just appeal, so make an inventory and get everything properly filed away. I'll leave the door open. He watches Pulford struggle out of the room, feels something of himself go with him. The heat is stifling, and the desktop fan simply shifts the hot air from one part of Staff's office to another. In the city, it seems there's nowhere to hide from the beating sun and the trapped fumes. It comes up from the underground, comes down from the cloudless skies. A shape appears in the doorway. D.C. Josie Chancellor looks dishevelled. Her skirt is all creased around her lap, and the top three buttons of her shirt are undone. I hear you're actually taking some leave, sir. I don't know why everyone's so interested. It's only a week. Congratulations on the Golding case. It was a team effort. You should be congratulating yourself, Chancellor. Josie closes the door and makes her way into the room. She rests her bottom on the edge of his desk, crosses her legs at the ankle. You were after him long before I arrived. I heard about the threats in court. It's nothing. Staff feels his heart hitch up. He's been threatened before and doesn't know why he should be so bothered by this one. Maybe he's getting too old for this game. What did you get him on in the end? Conspiracy with intent. Thanks to Sohan Kelly. You look as though you could do with a drink. I'd love to. But you won't. We could get something to eat, he says. I need to change. You look fine to me. Haven't you got a pack for your holiday? I travel light. He stands up, takes his suit jacket from off the back of his chair, slings it over his shoulder. You should wear suits more often, Staff. You look good. And you... He looks towards the closed door, rubs his fingers into the hollow where his head meets his neck, wet from the long, hot day. Yes? You look just great. How do you know what a girl wants to hear? I don't. I just tell the truth. You know that. Josie gives him a knowing look. That's the best and worst of you, sir. Carl Colquhoun steps over the off-cuts of wood and tramps through the sawdust. If he closes his eyes, he can imagine walking in a forest undergrowth. He punches in the security code to the staff toilet and pushes open the door. It smells the way you'd expect a men's toilet in a builder's merchant's to smell. Carl presses down the cold tap with the ball of his hand. He waits for it to run cold and paddles the water onto his face, then the back of his neck. He can hear the tin voice of a radio over the tannoy. It's a road show somewhere by the sea, and reminds him of the last time he and Leanne went to Margate. He shouldn't have gone. By law. There's another twenty minutes until the afternoon break, and he'd love to have his tea out the back with the rest of the boys, taking in the breeze that comes up off the dual carriageway, but he won't. He needs to keep himself to himself. He's been here nearly a year, 
but now the word is out. Carl leans on the basin, looks into the smeared mirror. He squints, sees a young and pure him looking back. He closes his eyes, pictures himself and Leanne in a quiet corner of the beach, waves collapsing, then the rolling lull of pebbles rattling, wet, gulls free and squawking in a vast blue sky. He opens his eyes and sees himself for what he is. He straightens up. Tonight, he will take Leanne down to the Thames, where at low tide there's a kind of beach. Then he remembers they're not talking. Haven't been properly since they came back from Margate. She loves him, for sure. She tells him every day, but she's just not herself right now. A loud rap at the door startles him, and he calls, uh, Won't be a minute. Then there's the duller sound of a hard fist banging. The fucking frag's in there. It's Dennis's voice. Jacking off. Ross Dennis is new at Marvid's Builders Merchants, arriving last week with Carl's whole history to hand, on account of the fact that he is a cousin of Leanne's. It took Dennis less than a day to start telling everyone that Carl is the reason Leanne has had to give up her kids to the social. The Carl in the mirror is a frightened man, looking older than his years. He'll be moving on soon, now Dennis has let the cat out of the bag. He'll put an advert in the papers out north. They won't know him from Adam up in Golders Green and Muswell Hill. The plan is to go back to doing what he does best, Cabinet-making. French polishing. The money is good, so long as he can tide himself over until word gets round and his first raft of invoices get paid. For the rest of the afternoon he bags up sawdust and then slopes away without saying goodbye. Nobody has ever proved that Carl Colquhoun interfered with the kids from his first marriage, or with Leanne's. Even so, he's made sure there'll be no further heartbreak because he's had the snip, and Leanne, at the age of twenty-four, got herself sterilised. Carl gets the seventy-three back home and goes upstairs, sits right at the back on the left-hand side, watches East London pass him by on his route back towards the city. An office gent sits in front, smelling of booze and wearing a handmade suit. He makes Carl under heave. He should get up, switch to another seat, but he can't move. His muscles are slack. One by one, he weighs up exactly who is on this deck of the bus. His breathing is tight, his head light. He leans forward and stares at the floor, but the sweet fumes of booze get thicker. He breathes through his mouth and counts down from five hundred. And as soon as he can feel his legs again, he summons all his strength, stands. Staring at the floor, he makes his way down the stairs and gets off, a stop early. On the walk back to the lime kiln estate, he goes to the halal shop to get milk and antiperspirant. While he is queuing, the whiff of booze hits him again, but when he's paid and turns to see who's wearing it, nobody is there. Carl's heart stops, then beats double time and won't slow down. His fingers tremble and his stomach feels empty. He walks quickly back to the lime kiln estate, head bowed, all the way up to the urine-stained concrete deck of the lime kiln tower, accompanied by the sound of barking dogs. Why do people keep killer animals in a tower block, he wonders, picking up a used syringe and putting it in his pocket before a child comes across it. He just wants to be inside, to lock the door behind him and wait for Leanne to come home. They won't go out tonight. The river can wait. He pulls out his key, and his watch beeps. It makes him jump. It is precisely four. He slips his key in, but before he can turn it, Carl is startled by a pungent whiff of drink. He feels a shadow on him and his skin prickles. 
His muscles go slack, and again he can't move. The shadow gets darker, colder, and as he turns round, he sees a looming, masked figure. Wide, piercing eyes, blood-red lips. He closes his eyes and raises his hands to protect himself, but he is too late, and hears a dull, cracking noise. A searing pain shoots through his skull, down into his neck. His legs give way, and he falls heavily on the lime kiln concrete, his skin ripping on the floor. Somebody laughs. A bully's laugh. Carl wants to curl up and let the dark come, for it all to be over, but he forces himself to look up. He sees a hand on the key to the door. He reaches into his pocket for the syringe, but a searing pain jags up and down along his arm. He looks at the leg of the person who clubbed him and bites into his own lip, forcing his hand into his pocket. He can feel the syringe and takes a grip, eases his hand out of the pocket. He breathes in as much air as he can and sizes up the leg. He can kill someone by sliding air into their blood. But just as he pulls his arm back to stab into the leg, it shifts and he feels a vast thud to his balls. It forces all the air out of him, and now the dark comes for him. When he comes round, Carl is looking at the ceiling of his bedroom. He can't move, and there's something metal in his mouth. He can't move his jaw or tongue, and his insides feel raw. He tastes blood. Someone in a white mask, with black eyes and blood-red lips, holds a whiskey bottle aloft. As they get closer, the blood-red lips make the shape of a smile. He strains to close his mouth, but all he can do as the whiskey is poured and poured is shut his eyes tight, feel the liquid burn him all the way down into his stomach. With each swallow, he cries another soundless sob, drowned by the spirit. He suddenly feels rough hands on his midriff, down the waistband of his jeans. They tug them down, rip his shirt open. The person in the mask shows him the bottle with one hand, in the other, a long, thin, glinting, sharp blade. Carl's bowels subside as he feels the cold steel on him. Hears someone say, This is from the children. Carl fears that this is not the moment he will die. He fears the last breaths will be long and drawn out. As the white-hot line is drawn around his balls, he sees one last thing a silver gleam getting bigger and bigger in his sight. He tries to close his eyes, but fingers force one eye open, and the blade comes impossibly big, until it obscures all the light and touches him. As he waits for the pain, he knows his heart does not beat when it should. You don't hear it until it is gone. The blood inside him runs up against itself, and a choir bellows out. He prays for it to cease. Staff looks across at Josie and smiles. They're in the kitchen of the house in Kilburn that he's just finished renovating. You're not eating, she says, putting a knife and fork together on the empty plate. I'd rather cook than eat. You're a people pleaser, she laughs. Who'd have thought it? Try telling that to Jadis Golding. Not pleasing our Jadis doesn't make you a bad person. Staff spears a scallop with his fork and runs it through the beurre blanc sauce. She stops eating and takes a slug of wine, watching him. You've got big hands, she says. Big fingers. My fingers are too big and I'm too old, he says. I like your fingers, Staff. Do you want some more wine, he says, picking up the bottle, offering to pour. 
I think I've had enough. She leans across and picks up her car keys from the middle of the table, spins them round on her index finger like a gunslinger with a revolver. You can stay, he says. It's only early. You don't mean that, in any way. What? Just have a good holiday. She has a soft, smudged smile. Sir? Staff scrapes the plates into the bin, rinses them, and when he hears the front door slam, he goes through to the living room. He watches Juicy skip down the steps and make her way toward the gap in the beech trees. Somehow she must know he's watching her go because she twiddles away with her fingers without looking, fixes her tights with the other hand, then slams the gate shut as she shouts at the kids to stop playing Kirby in the road. Tanya Ford can't get out of the house quick enough. She did her citizenship homework the minute she got in, and has been changing in and out of outfits ever since. The look is half fairy tale princess, half street corner slut. As soon as the doorbell rings, she scampers downstairs and out, linking arms with the best friend and calling back to her mother, Don't worry, as she's told not to be late, to be careful. I love you, Tan, calls her mother. And Tanya wants to call back that she loves her too, but she doesn't, just twiddles her fingers and blows a kiss. Her friend giggles. When they get to the corner of the road, Tanya folds the waistband of her skirt down once, twice, meticulously. She applies her lipstick and starts texting, feeling the slow rush of love that's in the air. Guy Montefiore tips 5%. He always tips 5%. He brings the fare to 12.85 and he waits for the change to come back through, asks for a receipt. The cabbie huffs and puffs, saying he can't find a pen. As he waits, Guy thinks about his daughter. Thomasina is 14, going on 19, and he worries about how she's getting on with her mother, picking up bad habits. He grimaces and exhales, blows the thought away. His mobile phone signals that it has received a text message, and he begins to palpitate. Forget the receipt, he says, as he opens the door and climbs out. You should carry a pen. It's a tool of your trade. He slams the door, harder than necessary. But her words appear on the screen, and his fury subsides. He begins to compose a response. A smile comes to his face. He wonders whether the summer will ever burn itself out. He prefers the shorter days of autumn and winter. The longer nights suit him. He doesn't have to wait two, three hours after work before there's the darkness to shield him. But the trouble with the long nights is that his loves are tucked up in bed, not out and about. Not any old love has got to be perfect, the way it never is for most people. Guy knows her name and her movements, knows her favourite pop star and who her best friends are. He's been watching so long now he can even guess what she'll be wearing. Monday night, youth club night, dressing like a tart, because that's what her friends do. It's not because she wants to be with a boy. She's not like that. No, Tanya simply wants to belong. And soon she will. Soon she will be loved, and she will be able to love back. The first time. Guy lets himself in the back door of the church hall, turning sideways and shuffling along between the rows of junk waiting to be collected. There is a dull light from the reinforced glass pane above the fire door, but he can do this in the dark. He passes the tiny kitchen and takes a deep breath, feels a swell in his loins. He presses the door to the stairs that go below, and the sound of music comes up. The bass vibrates, 
buzzes it up along his legs as he goes down into the dark, running his hand along the rough, unpainted bricks, feeling for the overalls. He takes them off the hook at the bottom of the stairs and undresses himself. He folds his clothes the best he can. They were, when all is said and done, made to touch him just so, at considerable expense. Guy laments that Tanya has never knowingly seen him at his best, but feels a surge at the thought that soon, so very, very soon, that will change. He makes his way towards the chinks of light that come through the gaps in the stage. As he goes, the music gets louder. He distills the sounds. A hundred teenagers dancing, giggling, scurrying. The deeper voice of a young alpha male as the song peters to an end, demanding what the next one should be. For a moment, it is just the soft flesh of voices. Guy stops mid-step and holds his breath until the next song cranks up. He crouches down in the usual spot, stage left. It's where the gap in the sections that make up the stage is greatest. It's also where she stands. Thank God she's such a creature of habit. Guy presses his face to the painted wood, and for the first time in twenty-three hours... Looking up from just above the level of the dance floor, he sees her. She's wearing his favourite skirt and a cut-off silky top that is new. He should be annoyed with her. It shows too much. Tanya's legs are impossibly smooth, and they have tanned to the colour of milky coffee. Her tummy has the tiniest pod of puppy fat. Her hips haven't quite spread wide yet. She pivots hand pointing out as someone he can't see in a gesture of ironic drama. Someone nudges her, and her skirt swirls as she turns to see. He can see the finest down in the hollow of the small of her back. His breathing is deeper, shorter. He feels the knot in the pit of his stomach tighten. Weak in the legs, he falls back on his haunches, lies all the way back for a moment and lets the music wash over him. He can smell the wood of the bare boards. In the dark, he pictures her dancing, her friends drifting away slowly, one by one, until she's all on her own. It takes staff fifteen minutes to pack. Two T-shirts and two long sleeve shirts, two pairs of shorts and a pair of dockers. He'll travel in his jeans and an old linen jacket. Eight pairs of boxes and socks, and Douglas's History of Etta. And he's done. He checks his phone, sees the missed call from his sister, Marie, and he tries her, but there's no response. He leaves a message to say he's going away, and he hopes Harry is fine. He deliberates, says, And you, too. Staff first went to Bilbao twenty years ago to identify what remained of his parents. His sister was off the rails and somewhere in the Far East, so he was left to cope on his own. He made the arrangements to bring them back home. He gave up on university, and as soon as his share of the proceeds of their estate came through, he bought a flat in South Ken for cash. A year later, he took out a mortgage to buy another. Then the compensation came through. Funny, how you can measure the value of two people. Put a price on what it might be worth to not have a full complement of parents. In the ensuing months and years, young staff drank too much and made friends too readily, took recreational drugs too much and too often. He got up later and later, and sometimes not at all. And he charmed the birds down from the trees the way he always could a gift that deserted him for only the briefest period of his mourning. And the lovers became part of his mourning, so an analyst had once told him. Gradually, after he joined the force, he dropped his vices, one by one. Three years ago, when he lost Jessop, his partner in the force, 
staff went back to the Basque country to resume the process of finding whoever left that bomb in the seafront restaurant. Sylvie had left him too, and he felt as if there was nothing but empty space all around him. He swore to build up the evidence piece by piece. He would gain a conviction, and he would gift the killer justice rather than retribution. In his dreams, he asks the killer to seek forgiveness, and on his parents' behalf, he grants it. In his darkest moments, he cannot see a way to do this. The renovated house smells of fresh plaster and varnished woodwork, new carpets too. It is too big for him, far too much space. He calls Rosa, but there is no response. He decides to go out anyway and makes his way upstairs for what has become a ritual. In the bathroom, he takes out his running gear from the Adidas bag and turns on the shower. The water jets down, hard on his scalp and shoulders. He takes the heat up a notch, so it's almost scalding him, and he scrubs and scrubs with the soap. The smell of coal tar gets thicker and thicker, the steam gets more and more dense. This evening he will run out to Kentish Town and through Islington into the city. Rosa lives in the Barbican. There is a chance, he thinks, in more optimistic snatches, that she knows where he's coming from. Looking up at her place, it is plain that Rosa has company. Staff's lungs are bursting, and he is dripping with sweat, happy to be at rest. He goes into the piazza and leans against a raised flower bed. He breathes deep, and his chest burns. He runs his hand around his neck and feels the dirt coming away. As the evening comes slowly on, he thinks of Rosa the first time. Sylvie had been gone a couple of months, and his partner Jessop had been shipped out to the Met. Staff got an assault call. Not really his bag, but he was in the area. Rosa was in her flat, the one he is looking up at now. It was a neighbour who called, but Rosa, crying, didn't want to press charges. Staff held her and said she didn't have to, and as she drew back her head to kiss him, thank you, he saw her bruised eye up close. To this day he doesn't know why, but he held on to her, a hand on each hip. Her body felt so soft even through her clothes. Let me take you out, he said. Help you forget this. I don't think you know what I do, she said. I think I do, and I don't think I care, he said. He took her out for dinner, and afterwards they went to a place of his in Belsize Park. He told her she was like one of Goya's women. Later, he had to explain it was young Goya. He showed her, and it made them laugh. That first night, they listened to Miles Davis and Bessie Smith, and he made a real hot chocolate, and he held her, and nothing happened. When she went to the bathroom, he rifled through her diary and clocked the name of the guy who was down for that evening. He wanted to go out and beat him to a pulp, but he didn't. You all right? You don't look all right, she had said when she came back. You look sad. Don't I always, he had said. Not to me. She pulled him towards her and began kissing him. He let her for a while and then he said, I love somebody. You deserve to, she said. Three days later... Staff found out where Rosa's client worked and went through his police history. The man worked as a money broker, and Staff guessed his employers didn't know what their young gun had done in his past. So he told them. He felt bad about it for as long as it took him to remember the bruises on Rosa's face. A middle-aged man comes out onto the deck in front of Rosa's flat. He'll have come straight from work for a happy hour. Staff makes his way up there, passes the man on the stairs, 
He smells expensive, has a kindly smile and a wedding ring. He knocks on Rosa's door, and her face lights up. She kisses him and ushers him in, and they talk. Not much more, the way it has always been. And when he gets back to the renovated house in Kilburn, he draws the new curtains against the still bright mid-evening sun and lays back on his sofa, listening to the children playing in the street. He closes his eyes and encants a mantra that lulls him into sleep. He dozes briefly and fitfully, tossing and turning through visions of Sohan Kelly and Jadis Golding. His family and gang with their smug threats. We'll kill you, Kelly! We'll kill you, Wagstaff! And he wakes to the telephone rattle and rubs his eyes. It is still light, and he leans down, reaches for the old Bakerlite phone, an SOC freebie that was never called as evidence. He could have returned it to its owner, but the owner never made it back from intensive care. There was no next of kin. Yes, he snaps. Sir, says Pulford. Staff hears his DS anew, the voice sounding older, more grave than in the flesh. It's bad, sir. Bad. His breathing is short. Bad, says Staff. I've never seen anything like it. Pulford is a graduate trainee resented by practically all his colleagues, and even though staff can't be sure he'll last any kind of distance, he resists the temptation to hold a person's intelligence against them. What is it? I didn't know whether I should call you. Well, you did. I can refer it to Pennington. I said, what is it? A uh, murder, sir. Staff pictures Pulford pacing, his ruddy cheeks gone pale, grey. Uh, no, more an execution. Where? On the Lime Kiln estate. Put me through to Janine. Uh, you're supposed to be... Just do it. Staff imagines the walk to the scene of crime up through a guard of honour of ten to fourteen-year-olds taking time out from running crystal meth and crack. It's the very bottom rung on the most rickety ladder. One or two will get to have the Subaru Impreza and drink Cristal, have someone else running bags for them. Most will end up using, going down the line, falling by the wayside forever. It's as easy as a slow, soft squeeze on the trigger of a gun that slipped into your hand by a man with a smile on his face. As he waits to be put through, he stands up, kicks the bed, forgetting his feet are bare. Shit! What? Uh, Janine! You're on the lime kiln! He thinks he can hear her swallow before she speaks. Been here an hour or so? You're supposed to be on holiday. There's a quiver in her voice. I'll be there in quarter of an hour. Staff washes his face and under his arms, then throws on a button-down shirt. He picks up his packed bag and feels himself switch on as the setting Kilburn sun spears into the hall through the stained-glass panel at the front door. It's a Victorian house, and the door is a perfect match. He got it years ago from a reclamation yard up in Southgate. He was with Sylvie when he bought it. Staff's heart sags, and he says, No, out loud to himself. He can't quite stop all the sadness. He wants to have been a better man. He shrugs, even though he's alone. He's been alone too long not to value himself as an audience. He pulls the heavy front door closed behind him and wishes the kids weren't still playing Kirby in the road. He thinks about telling them to watch themselves, but says nothing. Sometimes your spirit is too frail to take casual profanities from the nine-year-old loved ones of your neighbours. Round the back, up the narrow lane that his house backs onto, 
He slips the big fat key into the big fat padlock that tries to ward off evil spirits from his lockup. He takes two steps back, bringing the doors with him, looking at his two cars. It's a night for the crap one. It's almost always a night for the crap one. There's an ingrained pall of long-ago cigarettes in the old Peugeot, and as he twists the ignition key, Staff feels a burning yen for a long, slow drag on a Rothmans. The diesel engine coughs up like a one-lung smoker. The radio comes on of its own accord, and he turns it up a notch. Stravinsky, he thinks, and the violins scratch away over the long, slow swoon of brass and wind. He thinks it's the firebird. He doesn't mind Stravinsky, but he wishes it was Grieg. Something smoother for a night like this. He pictures himself on a Basque waterfront, all alone, watching the Atlantic swell. Janine is outside the victim's flat when staff gets to the lime kiln. The victim is Carl Colhoun, 36-year-old with two conditional discharges. Round here, that makes him an angel. As staff approaches Janine, walking along the decked concrete access, it looks as if she might be taking in the sunset, leaning on the rusted railing and peering out over the quadrangle of the lime kiln. The crime scene tape is out, more a curtain going up on a new drama than a shield to keep folk away. The people have come, hanging around in groups. It's like a bear pit, and staff thinks what a sick joke it is that it takes something like this to bring a community together. Staff leans out and calls down to the uniformed officers to disperse the growing crowd. The officers shrug. They move towards the cluster of small groups, and staff waits for a reaction, half expecting something to flare. But it doesn't. One or two women move forward, out of the groups and up to the officers. They start talking, gesturing up to the fifth floor, snarling. What the hell's going on, Janine? She shakes her head, says nothing and nods towards the door. Two uniformed officers are standing by it. Their faces are ashen. These are men who've seen most of the worst that London can muster. I'll take a look. You can talk me through it in a minute, hey? He says, putting a hand on her shoulder. He lets it rest comfortable. He takes a step towards her, whispers into her hair, Take your time. Thanks, staff. I'll be all right in a minute. He runs his hand down her back, feels the hollow of it small with the ball of his thumb. He smiles. Her eyes go soft, damp, and they each remember a happy time that should have lasted longer. Staff remembers her eyes, wild and wide, the unlikely words that came out of her thin mouth. Staff, she says. Yes? She takes a hold of his hand, looking around to make sure they're not seen. Nothing. She squeezes his hand. Staff takes a deep one, makes his way in. Where is Pulford? He's gone back to the station. It hit him hard, poor love. She says it without irony. It's not his first. You'll see when you get there. Everywhere there are signs that the usual people have attended to the usual necessaries. The evidence is bagged and sitting on the plastic-looking oval dining table. But nobody's here. No one stayed longer than necessary. A brown formica display unit matches the dining table. Its veneered ply shelves shoulder school pictures of two different kids. The kids aren't smiling. Most school photographers can cut a smile from the shyest or most miserable of children. And now Staff feels it. A cold shiver runs up his spine. His scalp pinches. Not a happy home, this. Not by any stretch. 
The hallway to the bedrooms is papered with big dark flowers, and as he opens the first door, the smell hits him. A deep, sweet smell which catches at the top of his throat. He takes a big stride in, clocking the feet splayed at the foot of the bed, trainers still on, a piece of pink gum between heel and sole in the hollow that never rubs clean. Carl Colquhoun's trousers are ruched around his ankles, and a brown crust has formed all around the leg flesh. It spreads onto the unmade bed. Blood, still red, is streaked down Carl's thighs, thickest around his groin. Then, Staff sees it. His hand instinctively takes a hold of his mouth and nose. He wants to gag, but hears Janine rustling up behind him. The human eyeball is spherical, she says. The testicle measures 2.5 centimetres by 5 centimetres, but it's oval. That's why it's protruding, says Janine. They would have had to sever the optic nerve, which is half a centimetre thick. It would require some kind of blade or a pair of scissors. Same with the vast deference. His balls, she nods. It would require significant force, a decent blade, and someone who knew what they were doing. Staff pretends to be observing the body, but he focuses on infinity. Either that or a quick learner. A strong stomach, for sure. Wouldn't there be two of them? One to hold him down. We'll have to wait for the autopsy, but my guess is he was paralytic. There's an empty litre of scotch by the bed, says Janine. She sounds tired. There's swelling to the jaw. I'd guess it's fractured. Staff forces himself to look back at the body. He needs to see it in situ. He focuses on the man's face, feeling himself about to heave, but he swallows it away and squints. He suddenly feels as if he's connected somehow to this awful situation. He knows this man. He's sure he does. He grabs a pair of gloves and pulls them on, goes into the lounge and rummages through the drawers in the sideboard, eventually finds a photograph of Carl Colquhoun. He's right. This man has been in Staff's house. The best part of a year ago, he'd gone down to Staff's flat in Queen's Terrace, South Ken. Not only that, Staff had made him cups of tea while he repaired the marquetry on a cob writing table. Carl Colquhoun did a wonderful job. He was painstaking and uncompromising, a craftsman. You'd think he had something to offer a civilised society. Staff goes back to the bedroom and looks down at Carl Colquhoun. The man this happened to. The way they did it. He's no ordinary victim, perhaps no kind of victim at all in some people's eyes. He turns his back and walks through the flat, nods at the uniformed officer on the door who says, Sir, shall I lock the place down? Staff nods and thinks of the warmer climb that awaits him with a far older and political crime that killed his parents, supposedly a crime of reason. And he wonders whether that makes it better or worse than the brutal slaying of Carl Colquhoun. No angel, perhaps. Regardless... He'll chase them down. It's what he does. Walking down the stairwell, the sounds of his own footsteps echo against others coming up at him. As he passes them, they look down, and at level two, the smell of aerosol paint is thick and new. Even while the police are here, they're tagging the place. The chemicals catch in his throat, and Staff takes the last few flights two steps at a time and runs out into the courtyard, gulping at the air. Someone's in a hurry! Pennington is leaning against the old Peugeot. He pushes himself off the rusted car and dusts himself down, adjusts the knot of his tie. He looks more like an accountant than a chief inspector. 
He is wiry, with dark, sheened hair that has more than a hint of just for men. As always, he wears a double-breasted suit. He shoots his cuffs. Didn't expect to see you here, staff. I'm off in the morning, sir. First thing. Couldn't resist a look, eh, Inspector? Pennington puts a hand on his Seamaster watch, takes a studied look at the time. We can manage without you. He fixes staff with a lame smile. I just thought what with Rimmer off on the long sick. Stress! Ha! Pennington looks past staff and up towards the lime kiln tower. He talks as if he's being recorded. Don't you think that if the word didn't exist, the condition would never arise? He mimics a whine. I'm all stressed out. He looks straight at staff, slit eyes. Well, everybody's stressed, unless they do fuck all. It's what keeps us going is good for us. Some more than others, perhaps, sir. You don't get stressed, though, do you, staff? No chance of that. You get yourself on holiday. How long's it been? Two years? Longer? He nods. You don't want me to stay, sir? I'd have thought that with the Golding episode, you'd see the advantage in keeping a low profile. A bit of sun on your back. And what about Sohan Kelly? Will he be feeling the sun on his back? I hear he's about to be magicked off to India, but there's trouble with his visa. Kelly's taken care of. He needn't concern you. But he does, sir. He got us our conviction. Staff feels Kelly's original statement safe in his pocket. He wants to know exactly what kind of a hold Pennington has over Sohan to make him change the evidence the way he did. And what did it get him? Pennington gives Staff a look that could kill. He takes a step closer and lowers his voice. You know that bastard Golding and all the bastards he runs with had it coming. And you know that poor sort of a postmaster will be a quivering wreck for all his days. Kelly was your witness, Staff. Your witness. I'll get him away from here, don't you worry. Bloody visas. Staff can't say anything. Can't remind Pennington it was his idea to conjure up Sohan Kelly. He looks Pennington in the eyes. I've never believed that ends justify the means, sir. For fuck's sake, Staff. Pennington is talking through his teeth now. I'm not going to have another ethical debate. I'm telling you, what's done is done. And by Christ, justice has been done. Not my kind of justice, sir. There's no place in Jadis Golding's world for philosophers. Remember, Golding did it. And what's more, Wagstaff... The buck stops with you. Pennington jabs a finger at Staff, pulls himself up short from actually touching the chest. Don't I know it, sir? Don't I know it? Pennington plays with his cuffs again, calming himself. So, you get yourself off, Staff. Leave us to take care of this. He nods up at the lime kiln tower. It's a done deal by the looks of things. The wife's gone missing. Odds on it's her. Open, shut. And if it's not? Then we'll gather the evidence. The way we always do. You're short-handed. There's always the Met if we're struggling. The Met? Pennington turns sideways, takes a step away. Get yourself off, Staff. Trust me, we can survive without you. Staff makes his way into the night. 
As he walks towards his car, Pennington's jag purrs past, red lights fading to nothing, and just as he is left all alone with the lime-kiln tower looming like a monster in the dark sky, he hears a bang, and glass falls to ground from the streetlight above. The street goes dead, dead dark. Staff stops in his tracks, fears the worst. He clenches his fists in readiness. For what? He looks behind him and up at the dark tower. Then he hears something. He peers into the dark, sees a moving shape by his car. He knows he can't take a backward step, so he walks slowly towards his car, watching his steps. Cat calls ring out from inside the lime kiln. Dogs bark. Closer, Staff is sure he can hear breathing. Heavy. As he gets to the car, he hears something behind him and he spins round, calls out, Who's there? He flicks on his pocket mag light and casts a sharp beam out into the night. Nothing. He checks up and down the street. When he turns to his car... The beam illuminates a fresh violation. The letter J is key-carved into the car door. J, he says aloud. Jadis bloody golding, he whispers to himself. Opposite, two figures in baseball caps and hoods drawn down look out at him from a boarded shop doorway. They could be anybody. A car speeds by. Anybody could be in it, carrying anything. In the city, there's too many people, too many vehicles. The headlight swoop seems to show that the hooded youths in the doorway are smiling. Back in his suit, Guy Montefiore is inconspicuous. In this part of Fulham, the worlds of city and media rub shoulders with white trash. He switches back and forth, avoids the one or two streets that butt up from the big estates. He makes the smallest detour to pick up some tonic water from odd bins, and as he comes back out onto the street, a man in a flight jacket on the opposite side of the road turns quickly away. Guy checks around him. It doesn't feel as if he's being watched, and he knows, as one who watches, what to look for. He doesn't have to wait long when he gets to Tanya Street. Tanya Ford uncouples her arm from her friend, and they kiss on both cheeks. Tanya skips up the steps to her tiny townhouse, and the door opens before she can knock. She is loved, but she didn't see Guy. She never does. Within ten minutes, Guy is delving into his Geeves and Hawks trouser pocket and sticking his key into a million quids worth of late Victorian terraced house. He kicks off his shoes and goes into the study that used to be the family room. He dials Thomasina's number. As it rings, and usually it rings and rings and rings before she picks up, he tucks the phone into the crook of his shoulder and makes a middling G&T takes a sip and shoes the cat off his armchair with the tip of a toe. "'I want to speak to Thomasina,' he says to the male that answers. "'Some dirty bastard her mother has dragged home. "'Is that her dad? "'They said to say you can't. "'Who are you?' Guy's heart goes double fast. "'Fuck off! I'm a boyfriend!' Her Boyfriend? Whose boyfriend? Not Thomasina's. But it's dead. Tuesday morning. Staff has locked down the Kilburn flat and given Josie a key so she can take in the mail and water the plants. The tube doors slide shut and Staff feels a tiny pocket of emptiness. A single air bubble can close down an entire heating system. Last night, when he got back from the lime kiln estate, visions of Jada's golding tampered with his sleep again, and now he feels tired, 
shakes open the Guardian, trying to get the mind clean, working in straight lines again. But he sees the front page of somebody else's news. The headline is Self-Help Murder. He squints at the strap line that runs beneath an old photograph of Carl Colquhoun. A crime that's not a crime? More, pages four and five. He takes a hold of the news and tugs it down to see a wide-eyed young Asian man looking up, afraid. It's okay. I'm police. Can I borrow your paper? The young man nods, folds it neatly and hands it across. Staff accepts it, says, Sorry, here, have this, handing him the Guardian. According to the news, Colhoun's murder is a crime of passion. His wife, apparently, has had to give her children up because of what Carl did to his kids from a previous marriage. And if the wife did it, could that make her more saint than sinner? She would be doing society a favour. Staff rereads the report, but his mind is distracted by the very opposite kind of a killing, as cold-blooded and indiscriminate as they come. He closes his eyes, tries to picture his coming together with Santi Echtbataria in Spain. The train builds speed on its way towards Heathrow as the distance between stations grows. It rocks from side to side, and the more staff thinks about what happened to his parents, the closer his eyes clench tight shut. His stomach churns, and his mouth slowly fills with fluid. He swallows. He wants to be sick. He wants to get off, but knows he can't. DCI Pennington scans the room to check on the team at his disposal. The temporary incident room at Leadengate Station is undersized and packed tight. I want you, Johnson, to stay bang on top of this. Report directly to me and keep them at it. With a bit of luck, this should be done and dusted within a week. Pennington looks around the room. Where is D.S. Pulford? On his PlayStation, calls out one of the DCs. The laughter spreads. Very funny. Now, where is he? The room falls silent. Well, find out. I want everyone keyed into this. Done and dusted, I say. Done and dusted. Johnson had been off on the sick for a week, but he soon got better when he heard staff was on his way to Spain, that Pennington needed someone to ride shotgun. Now he stands tall, leaning against the open door, red hair receding, his sleeves rolled up, showing thick, pale forearms, freckled like a salmon. He is struggling to keep the smile off when he feels a tug on the tail of his jacket. You're better, Johnson. He turns round, hisses, Bloody hell! What are you doing here? I thought I'd keep an eye out. You heard the DCI. It's practically done and dusted. In which case, I can take my leave next week. And anyway, where is Pulford? says Staff, leaning against the far wall, obscured from Pennington's line of vision. You heard? On his PlayStation. I know you know, Johnson. So why don't you just tell me? He's chasing down the wife. Leanne Colquhoun. And he's taken a counsellor, or at least a WPC, says Staff. All Johnson can do is shrug. You bloody idiots. She's got a sister down South End. And Pulford's got a warrant? Johnson shakes his head. Feels like he's at school again. But just as Staff prepares to unleash a full onslaught, Johnson sees his attention wane. It's D.I. Wagstaff's turn to play the schoolboy as Pennington gets wind of him. Staff! booms the D.C.I. What the hell? In Staff's office, 
Pennington stands dead still in front of the window, pushes out his narrow pigeon chest and furrows his brow. I thought we agreed you should take some time away, especially after the Golding case. He can wait, sir. I had this under control, you know. I told you. We can survive without you. Staff wants to say, I know your game. You're pushing for commissioner. And if you can put a front-page crime to bed without your senior D.I., then that's all to the good, you ambitious bastard. But all he says is, I know, sir. He remembers the first time he ever met Pennington. Staff was a D.C., and had just been taken under D.S. Jessop's hard-nosed wing. Jessop and Pennington had both gone for the D.I. post, and Pennington had won. His knife was sharper. Jessop and Staff would be together for fifteen years, and even though Jessop made D.I., Pennington would always be a step ahead. Pennington turns his back, signifying their meeting is over and Staff's heart sinks as he reminds himself that Pulford has gone chasing after their only suspect without any backup. All he can hope is that Pulford draws a blank. D.S. David Pulford puts the unmarked Vectra through its paces, driving it a gear higher than you drive your own as he cuts down off the A127, following the estuary alongside the reclaimed land they've taken from Silt to make money. He tries not to think of the bollocking he might get, for not waiting for the warrant. He left a message for Carly Kellerman, Leanne Colquhoun's caseworker, and then had driven out of London as though it was he who was fleeing the scene, not Leanne Colquhoun. Nobody had seen Leanne come home to the lime kiln from a job at Surrey Racing, but around 6.30 she had run off the estate screaming like a banshee. From what Pulford has gleaned so far about Carl Colquhoun, he's led the kind of life that takes the victim out of murder victim. Give the wife a medal, not a prison sentence. What's the mother to do to protect her kids, is the way it sounds to most. Pulford knows the case could be an opportunity for him. But he quickly chastises himself for wanting to profit from such things, even though he, too, is something of a victim. He realises exactly what they think of him at Leadengate CID. A fast-tracked graduate who's already a detective sergeant, even though, some say, he knows jack shit, and has only taken four years to learn it. He had three years drinking and screwing, playing on his PlayStation and watching Countdown, while better men, men like Johnson, were getting their hands well and truly dirty, pushing back crime in the city's sordid corners. The sat-nav directs him onto a new-build brownfield estate down by the wide Brown River. It's designed for the aspirationalists, for thirty-somethings busting both balls to try to get ahead. It's not where you'd expect Leanne Colquhoun's sister to be. In other words, it's not Holloway. Pulford knocks twice, loud, and takes a step back. He looks at the pretty face that appears by the jamb of the door and glances down at the photo. It could be a dolled-up Leanne, he's not sure. I'm here to... Yes, she says. We were expecting you. Leanne's upstairs, you better come in. Take your shoes off, if you don't mind. Pulford's heart skips one, two beats. Now he knows she's here, he might be in Stuck. Might also be onto a good thing. She just wanted some time, you know? She nods towards the living room, and he goes through, wishing he had brought a WPC. I'm Detective Sergeant Pulford. Karen Donnelly. I'm Leanne's sister, but you know that, don't you? She sits down, looks out through the sliding metal frame patio doors that give on to ten by ten of new laid decking, a tiny lawn beyond, then medium brown fencing. She loved him, you know. Always did. Calhoun, 
says Pulford, taking out his notebook, scribbling away. She did the worst thing, but she did it for him. It's a terrible thing, love. She killed him for his own sake. She let them take her children away, says Karen Donnelly, staring to infinity. Love. Did she tell you she killed him? She fixes a stare on Pulford, lets it burn into him. He flinches and looks away as she tells him slowly to fuck off. Did Leanne tell you how he died? Karen Donnelly shrugs. He can't have treated her well. Karen looks at him as though she might be about to confide, but decides against it. She shakes her head. You'll have to come with me to the station. It's Leadengate in the city. Aha! Fancy crimes! Nothing fancy about this one, says Pulford, stopping himself from giving away any details of the cause of death. I've got to pick my children up from school at four. Then I have to make dinner. Then I've got to go to work. She looks around her home. To Pulford it seems as though she might resent it, the thing she does to pay for it. What about Leanne's kids? Doesn't she want to see them? Children? She's got children, says Karen Donnelly. Goats have kids. Don't ask her fucking nothing, says Leanne Colhoun, coming down the stairs. She looks younger than in the photograph, looks to Pulford as though a burden might have been lifted. We can get my kids on away. As long as it's all right with a fucking caseworker, I'd like to see them. Pulford looks at Karen, who looks at the floor. She looks ashamed. Staff parks the knackered old Peugeot in the Kilburn lockup, alongside another vehicle, which is covered in a dirty dust sheet. He closes the heavy steel doors, fixes the padlock, and looks up at the back of his house. Built to last by the Victorians. It was a good buy, but it's not home, and he thinks he might let it out, might move across to one of his better houses in a better neighbourhood even though it isn't long since the scaffolding came down and the skips were towed to landfill. He stops this thought, though, wondering if he's thinking this because of Golding's threats. Has he suddenly allowed a nineteen-year-old gangster to turn him into a coward? But is it cowardly to lean away from a blow, to swerve a tackle? There is a light on upstairs, even though it's daylight even though he turned everything off. He goes to the fence, presses his face against it, peers through a knothole in the wood. He can see a shadow moving across the dining window. He rushes around the front of the building and takes out his phone to call for backup. A closer inspection of the front door shows no sign of forced entry. He puts the phone back in his pocket and is just about to put his key to the door when he hears a scream from inside the house. It sounds like a woman, but he can't be sure, and Staff stands frozen. There is another scream, and the low murmur of someone crying. A raised voice through an open window upstairs. He locked the house down, he's sure. End of Disc 1 Disc 2 Staff runs down the steps to the lower ground floor and bounds back up, holding a spade that he keeps in a damp storeroom. He peers through the letterbox, sees nothing, but can smell recent cigarette smoke. He hasn't had so much as a drag on a Rothmans in three years. He puts the key to the door again, hands shaking, and takes a deep breath, steps inside. The noise comes from upstairs, and it is definitely a woman. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! She says, as if she is pleading for mercy or for help. As he goes up the stairs, spade in hand, Staff hears someone crying and tracks the sounds to the back bedroom where he had seen the light. 
He pauses, holds the spade out ahead of him, and notices splatterings of blood on the carpet. There is the trail from the bathroom. He kicks open the door to the bedroom, rushes into the room, and the howling of the woman within redoubles. What the hell? What the... Marie, he says. Her hands are covered in blood, horror written right across her face. Staff looks at a child, curled on the floor and clutching his blood-smeared head, sobbing. What's happened? Who did this? It's your fault, says his sister. It's your fault, you idiot, Will. Where did they go? Where are they? Staff is kneeling down by the child, taking him in his arms and saying, Harry, are you all right? Oh, Harry! Well, of course he's all right, she says. It's me that's cut. She holds out her arm to show Staff. I cut it on that stupid bloody shower screen of yours. What are you doing here, Marie? You said I could come any time. You gave me a key. Well, you could have let me know. You're supposed to be on holiday, if you can call it that. She looks daggers at him and sits on the edge of the bed, holding her bleeding arm. Oh, shut up, Harry. Please. Staff picks up his nephew from the floor and holds him to his chest, then sits on the bed next to his sister wraps an arm around her. Even though one is soaked in blood, the other in tears, he savours the moment, feels the relief course through his veins. It's nice to see you, Marie. Oh, yeah. Just great, she says. Young Harry is in Staff's lounge, bemoaning the fact that there is no Nickelodeon to be had from the small screen TV. The best Staff has managed is to dig out an old pack of cards and quickly teach him how to play pontoon. And now he has returned to the kitchen to patch up the boy's mother. You should go to hospital. I'll be fine, says Marie. Staff rolls her sleeve right up and looks at the wound. The glass shower screen cut the inside of her forearm, but missed the vein by a centimetre or so. He cleans the cut and applies iodine, which makes her flinch, and as she scrunches her eyes, he takes a closer look at the fresh bruise higher up on her arm. When she opens her eyes, she catches him and rolls her sleeve down. My bet is there's another one on the other arm. Am I right? Just concentrate on the cut, Will. I always said he was a bastard. And your life is just perfect. You should report him. He'll do it to someone else. Why do you always have to fight other people's battles? Well, you're my sister, for God's sake. And what about you, Will? Who are you seeing? My life is too complicated at the moment. You live alone, Will. It's the most uncomplicated situation a man can be in. Or is it this stupid quest of yours? They were your parents too, Marie. It was twenty years ago, for God's sake. Don't you think they'd want you to move on? Starve wants to tell her he has no choice. That he wants to move on. But he can predict where that conversation would go. I'm trying to do the right thing. Do the right thing for yourself. Look at Sylvie. No, let's not look at Sylvie. And anyway, at least I didn't run away when it happened. I didn't run away. I travelled. You blew your inheritance. I spent it. I invested it in experiences. You know, Will, sometimes I really don't understand where you get your values from. He thinks about this, which makes him remember his father, always working, occasionally talking about what he was going to do with his time when he retired. Would his father be proud of what he does? He'll never know. 
Staff feels lost, gazes at his sister. What would he make of us? How we turned out? Oh, Will, we have to live for ourselves. And not the ghosts, he says. She shrugs, looks embarrassed. I've never asked you for anything, Will. Harry's going to school at the end of summer. You know, if... Uh... Staff wraps an arm around her, pulls her into the crook of his neck and speaks softly. I'd love you to stay. I wish you'd come years ago. It's not to stay. We fight like cat and dog, Will. We always have. He lifts her sleeve and looks at the other bruise. I know. He rocks gently, holding his baby sister tighter and tighter, and trying not to picture what a mess she must be in to accept his help after all these years. Why didn't you go away? she says. The thought occurs to Staff that after all these years, he might be afraid of catching up with Santi Eshtbateria. Let's go and see how Harry is. Maybe I'll teach him to play poker. I can see you're going to be a fine role model. As they go, they laugh. She fixes her face, and he thinks that perhaps he really should move across town. Leadengate Station is quieter than Stark can remember. Every available officer is either out on the knock and search, or phoning down everybody who ever knew Carl Colhoun. Pennington received the call from the Commissioner and had to make a statement to the press. Staff makes his way towards the interview suites and hears the raised voices of his DSs, Johnson and Pulford, in the corridor. You should know to take support, says Johnson. I didn't want her to get away. It's not my fault you lack experience. Johnson sees Staff and he looks at his shoes. What the hell are you two firing off about? Staff slides the spy hole plate to the main interview room and sees Leanne Colhoun. He frowns. What if she heard that, you idiots? He says in a scolding whisper. He turns to Johnson. What do you know about Colhoun's first wife? He says to Johnson. Deborah Bowker. She's moved out of the country to Tenerife. Get me her number, and find out how long she's been there. I need the dates of all her visits since she left, and double-check with the airlines. Johnson looks daggers at Pulford, and staff can see that he is gutted to have lost out on this case. He puts a hand on Johnson's shoulder, and ushers him down the corridor, saying as he goes, I know where you're coming from, Rick, but we're a D.I. down anywhere at the moment, with Rimmer on the sick. This could be the biggest case we'll get in years, and the press are all over it already. We've got to pull together. Is that why you came back? Even though there's venom in Johnson's voice, he has dark rings under his eyes. It seems to Staff his DS should be at home, resting. Staff looks back at the young Pulford, getting the breaks that Johnson thinks he deserves. If that's your attitude, you'll still be a DS when you pick up your pension. If you can't pitch in as part of a team, you know damn well I can. It's not what I'm seeing just lately. I thought this was going to be my chance, boss. Never mind. Johnson shoots staff a resigned look, gives a tired what-the-hell raise of the eyebrows. But it'd be nice if you cut me some slack sometime. Just let me tell the Muppet what a tosser he is every now and again. Staff laughs and slaps Johnson on the shoulder, watches his DS make a weary way down the corridor. Johnson turns and calls, I'll get Bowker's coordinates for you, boss. Good man, says Staff, watching the dishevelled Johnson go. He and Becky have three young children, and he's all done in. 
Staff looks back at Pulford, leaning against the wall, young and fresh, tall and thin with his hair cut in trendy mini quiffs. His suit is sharply tailored, no doubt paid for by his mum. Staff takes a deep breath and goes back towards Pulford. Staff will not chastise Pulford for racing off after Leanne Colquhoun. He is pleased that the young pup came back with something to show his sceptics, despite riding roughshod through procedure. He returns to the interview room, bends down to look through the spy hole at Leanne Colquhoun. She sits calmly on the far side of the desk, the bare bones of an attractive woman. Not yet twenty-five, but all gone to seed. She's got her hair scraped into a severe, high-up ponytail. Not enough eye makeup and too much lipstick. Her eyes are narrow and hard, her cheekbones high and sharp. The skin of her neck is tight, and there are three lines on her forehead that don't go away when she stops scowling. Staff doesn't fancy her, not for this one, not as a murderer. But almost everyone else in the building does. He can tell she hasn't been crying, even though only twenty-four hours ago she purportedly returned from her afternoon shift down at Surrey Racing to find her lover lying on her bed, blood soaking the sheets from the accomplished butchery. Just thinking about it now makes Staff feel sick. Carl Colquhoun's heart probably stopped beating from wave after wave of pain, not from the loss of blood from the fine cuts that were applied to the scrotum, but from the eyes. The killers knew what they were doing. They knew they would not be disturbed. There were no noticeable signs of entry, which doesn't help Leanne's cause. A litre of supermarket brand whiskey had been forced upon Colquhoun, and he may well have been passing in and out of consciousness before being tied to the bedposts. As well as semen, blood and excrement, the bedsheet showed residues of vomit. Everywhere, naturally, were the prints and DNA of Carl and Leanne Colquhoun, and nobody else. Staff ushers Pulford towards him, says, Tell me again what exactly she said about Carl. She loves him. Sorry, she loved him. Did she mean it? She said she didn't believe it had happened. Staff looks at Leanne again, dragging on a cigarette so her cheeks sink in even further, gaunt like the victim of a Balkan war, and staring with clear grey eyes. You would never guess what she had seen, or done, in her own home so recently. And while the owner of the betting shop swears blind she didn't leave the office at all that afternoon, staff has discovered that to be a lie. Leanne Colquhoun had fled the lime kiln scene without her handbag. That's the kind of hurry she was in. In the handbag, there was a receipt for ibuprofen from the Londis, halfway between the lime kiln and Surrey Racing. The receipt was timed at 1546, and Janine's best guess for the likeliest time of death is 1500 to 1700. How come we're not getting stuck into her, sir? says Pulford. Staff pulls away from the spy hole. You should know why. She's entitled to a solicitor. She was happy enough to talk in the car. The car you brought her back in without so much as a WPC or a counsellor. She's a grieving widow, traumatised. Traumatised my ass. Your ass should be in a sling. Pulford leans back against the wall and looks up at the flickering fluorescent light. Why did the bookie lie? You think he's giving her one? She claims to have loved Carl Colquhoun. Loved him so much she couldn't see her own kids. Yeah, right. Staff taps the spy hole to the metal door. Tell me what you see. He watches Pulford peer into the interview room, listens as the young graduate begins his summary verdict. 
I see a woman who feels no guilt for stopping years of abuse of herself and her kids, and if you ask me, she's done our job for us. Oh, so now it's our job to castrate suspects, is it? You know what I mean. And where's the evidence? Oh, she lied about being in the betting shop. She fled the scene. The evidence that Carl Colquhoun interfered with his kids. You've spoken to the caseworker, Carly Kellerman. There's no evidence, says Staff. The CPS didn't have a case. Well, they took her kids away. That's a pretty good motive. She loved him more than her own children. She chose him. How could a woman do that to a man she loved? Well, she'd hate herself, wouldn't she? She'd want to make amends. Staff sighs, tries to make sense of everything he knows about Leanne Colquhoun. Wife. Mother. And even if he was messing with her kids... In this country, we don't chop the bollocks off. We leave it for somebody else to do, and then we punish the wrong person. We collect evidence and build the best case for the Crown. This is a civilised country. We don't always get the guilty man, but when we don't, it's so we don't fill our jails with the innocent. If he wasn't messing with her kids, why'd she do it? Who says she did? Well, if she didn't, who did? That's what we're going to find out. The door from reception clatters open, and Staff recognises who it is straight away. Slightly fatter than last time they met, and a little looser in the jowl. Stanley Buchanan and Staff started their careers on opposite sides of the same coin, and at the same time. Buchanan looks jaded and gives a tut-tut shake of the head. Maybe it's dealing more with the guilty than the innocent all your life and trying to treat the two the same that drives poor Stanley to drink. Time was, Staff and Stanley had that in common too. The complaints are on file already, D.I. Wagstaff, but I may as well tell you what I've told D.C.I. Pennington. He sits down next to Leanne Colquhoun and taps her twice on the shoulder. We'll have you out of here in two shakes of a lambkin's tail. Don't you worry, Leanne. Staff thinks this must be a good day for Stanley. Maybe just a couple of large ones down the old Dr. Butler's head. This is a bereaved woman, a woman of impeccable standing without so much as a caution to her name. What possessed you to allow a young sergeant to press-gang this poor woman? without a female officer or a counsellor in sight. Very good, Stanley, says Staff. You can call me Mr. Buchanan. I didn't force my way in, says Pulford. That's enough, Sergeant, says Staff. She fled the murder scene. She could have been trying to... I said enough. Staff turns to Leanne. Why didn't you call the police? She stares straight past him, says, I've got nothing to say to you. You could tell us why you'd lied about being in the bookies all afternoon, says Pulford. She looks up at Pulford, gives him a patronising smile. I want to see my kids. Buchanan says, There are three witnesses who say my client was only out of her place of work for ten minutes. You can see the children soon, Leanne, says Staff. They're in the Phoenix suite with the caseworker. Staff pulls up a chair, so he's sitting within a couple of feet of her. He waits for her to look at him and shoots Pulford a look to keep quiet. Eventually, Leanne does look up at Staff, and he smiles with his eyes. He thinks he can see a softening in the hard creases of her face, and he tunes into his softest voice, puts his forearm on the desk, and leans ever so slightly forward. She looks away, then straight back at him when he says, 
I'd like you to tell me about when they took your children away. Is it the way it looks on the file? I just want to see it the way you see it, that's all. Then you can go. Home? We'll see. He shoots the look at Pulford again. This is his case, and he's not settling for the obvious. You don't have to answer that, Leanne. It's irrelevant, says Buchanan. She looks back at Staff, makes the slightest of smiles, like faint parentheses at the corners of her mouth. He's got a history, Carl. At least that's what they say. Leanne talks about Carl Colquhoun as if he's still around, not lying blue-grey on a slab nearby with his belly and chest butterflied for autopsy. Staff listens as much to how she's talking as to what she says. And they said he was... Leanne Colquhoun nods. Staff can see she's fighting back the tears. Is it pride? Is it because if she cries, it's an acceptance he is dead? Do you believe them? Do you think he did that to his other children? I swear on my life he never touched a hair on my kids' heads. And would you swear on his life too? She looks at Staff, says, I love him. I love him so much. And the face goes soft. Where does a woman like me find love in this world? The creases in her forehead go smooth and she smiles. Her eyes are glassy and the tears come. And come. The Phoenix Suite, a newly built specialist unit for holding victims of sexual offences, is just five minutes down the road from Leadengate Station. And as staff approaches it, the Barbican shimmers in the summer heat. He is immediately shown into a brightly decorated room with windows overlooking a jungle-style garden. Children's paintings adorn the walls, and classical music is in the ether. From a Wendy house in the corner, a young woman in her early twenties appears on all fours. Hi, Will, she says, standing up, dusting down her skirt. Hi, Carly. In the windows of the Wendy house, the faces of two children become suddenly miserable. Carly Kellerman nods behind her and says... This is Calvin and Lee Angelique. Carly smiles brightly. Her hair is a bounty of rolling golden curls. Hello, says Staff, crouching and overly cheery. One look at Staff is enough to tell them that their fun is dead. Carly sits down at a low table and invites Staff to take a child's seat. She beckons the children and turns off the smile, nods earnestly as staff begins to ask his questions, encouraging the children to answer. Calvin is the younger, at six, but he does all the talking. Lee Angelique is eight, and simply stares at staff, her mouth turned down towards the floor. When was the last time you saw your mum? Sunday. We see her every Sunday and she took us to Margate. It's the best place. And what about Carl? Do you ever see him? At this, Lee Angelique gets up from the table and goes back into the Wendy house. We never see him. Mum talks about him. Staff looks at Calvin's hands, scrunched up into pudgy little fists. He can't come near us says Lee Angelique from inside the Wendy house. That's what she said. Shush, Lee Ange, says Calvin. But he came to the seaside. Calvin gets up, and Carly tries to comfort him, saying, He didn't. You've got it wrong, Lee, love. And he touched me. He did. Calvin shrugs Carly off, goes to join his sister in the Wendy house. He pulls the door closed behind him. He can't have, whispers Carly. 
they check. They can tell, you know. And she looks down into her own lap, shakes her head slowly. Calvin calls out from inside the Wendy house. Is Carl gone? He's gone away, says Staff. He won't be coming back. Calvin lets a smile appear, showing the gaps between his teeth. Lee Angelique is standing behind him, looking as though it will take much, much more to bring a smile to her face. Take these down to Secretarial and tell them it's important, says Staff, handing Pulford a tape of the interview with Leanne Colhoun and his notes from the meeting with Carly Kellerman and the Colhoun children. I'm going to have another word with Leanne Colhoun. He picks up his jacket from the back of the chair. It's swayed and too young for him, he thinks. It was Sylvie's choice, and if truth be known, it probably wasn't just the jacket that was too young for him. In the corridor, staff catches sight of Josie walking away. He walks double quick to catch up with her, but there's no need. She stands by the coffee machine. As he approaches, she presses a button, but nothing happens. It's out of order. What exactly is out of order, sir? I was wondering if maybe... He reaches his hand out, presses the flat of his palm on the wall that she is leaning against. What? She smiles. You know, I've heard you used to be a bit of a ladies' man, sir. And I heard you should believe half of what you see and nothing of what you hear, she says, laughing. My dad used to say that. Maybe he's right. Staff pushes himself up and away from the wall, runs a hand through his hair and takes a step back, tugs at his jacket. He's seen Pennington coming down the corridor and takes another step back. Wagstaff! Chancellor! says Pennington, the merest break in his stride. Sir, says Josie. Your office, Wagstaff. This Colhoun debacle, a quick word, if you will. A debacle, sir, says Staff, following the DCI into his office. Chancellor, booms Pennington from the doorway to Wagstaff's office. Get Pulford and tell the clever dick to bring his university educator backside down here Toot sweets. Pennington takes the seat behind Staff's desk. Turning the tables is his style. Before he got the move upstairs, Pennington was one of the canniest coppers Staff had come across. He must have been, to always be one step ahead of Jessop. Pennington picks up a pen and taps a ten-by-eight photograph that he has placed on the desk in front of him. Spins it around so Staff can see it. In black and white, the carnage of Carl Colhoun's butchered body looks even more grotesque. Staff leans forward, then stands back. He squints, to get the detail without getting too close, as if it might be contagious. When it was taken, only one of the testicles has been placed into an eye socket. By the side of the bed... Someone is leaning over his body, twisting to look into camera. They're wearing a peaked hood with eyes and a mouth cut out, a hurried imitation of the KKK, or a religious penitent. Their eyes are heavily made up with coal, and the mouth, smiling manically, is daubed with dark lipstick. Long blonde hair flows from the bottom of the hood. The figure is wearing white gloves, spattered with blood. Is that Leanne Colhoun? says Staff. I've got a bad feeling about this, says Pennington. The last thing we want is publicity. You know what the Commissioner's like. Sort this out fast, Staff. He leans forward, hands Staff a piece of paper. It's a photocopy of a note that has been pasted together from a newspaper. The news, judging by the typeface. See, justice, done. What I don't get, says Pennington, 
It's Carl Colquhoun has never even done time. There was that allegation three years ago, but nothing came of it. It's not a matter of public record, just a dead file down at the CPS. So if she didn't want him dead, who would? And want him dead the way he went? These are sadistic bastards. The question is... Staff? This was a Pennington ploy. The question is, sir... Staff is trying to not only deduce the profile of the likely murderer, but do it within the template of Pennington's own processes. The question is... Who would have suffered so much at the hands of Carl Colquhoun to feel the need, feel compelled to replicate that suffering? Like a mirror, to hold it up to him. I'm getting wind that you don't fancy the wife for this one, Staff. And she's the only one that answers your question so far. There's Deborah Bowker, Carl Colquhoun's ex-wife. She's in Tenerife, and according to social services, she took her kids with her, away from Colquhoun. How old are they? They'll be ten and twelve now. And I'm trying to get hold of Leanne Colquhoun's ex to see if he might have a motive. Tick-tock, staff. Tick-tock. There's a knock at the door, and before either staff or his boss can respond, Pulford strides in. He stands proud, legs apart, arms crossed. Anybody would guess he'd come for a commendation. His expression changes the moment Pennington begins to speak, his voice scarily quiet. What makes you so special, D.S. Pulford, as to be able to swan roughshod over the simple rules that the rest of us mortals have to follow? I fully support what D.S. Pulford did, sir, says Staff. Out of the corner of his eye he sees Pulford's head hang like a scorned schoolboy. Given the urgency of this case, sir, don't be clever with me, Staff. I want good evidence that we can present to a court of law. Good evidence and admissible statements, Staff. Pennington gets up, puts Staff's pen into his inside pocket and adjusts his tie. He closes the door behind him softly and Pulford says, Thanks, sir. Shut up, Pulford. Just bloody shut up. Stanley Buchanan smells of mint, which is unable to mask all the drink. Leanne Colquhoun's eyes are red, and it is clear that the truth is beginning to set in. I understand you took Calvin and Leangelig to Margate last weekend, says Staff. It was nice weather. So what? You took them there with your ex, did you? Calvin and Leangelig's dad. You've got to be joking. He's a waste of space. He never went. Must have been hard work for you on your own. Not as much as if he'd gone fighting or on a piss or trying to screw some slag. He's got a temper, has he? Holds a grudge. I'm better off without him, that's all. What's his name? Rob. Rob Boxall. But Carl was more of a help, was he? What do you mean? Well, no one would know, would they? Easy enough to slip away to the seaside. You're out of order, D.I. Wagstaff, says Buchanan. Why would Leangelique lie? She said Carl went with you. You said I could see them. I just need a few more questions answering. D.I. Wagstaff, says Buchanan, that sounds like an inducement. But Staff's watching Leanne. Her spirit is breaking and she murmurs into her lap. He's not like what I said. He's not. Where can I find your ex, Rob? Dalston, if he's not banged up. 
Try the rag. The ragamuffin pub? She nods, sniffing the tears away. Staff goes across to the desk, puts his finger on the stop button of the tape machine. Last question, Leanne. Where did you stay in Margate? The old Dickens. Sounds nice. It's a shithole. She looks up at Staff, pleading. He didn't do nothing, my Carl. He never done nothing to my babies. It's all lies. Leanne wrings her hands in her lap. Staff presses stop and feels like a complete bastard. Even Stanley Buchanan gives him a look as if to say, How low can you get? Leadengate Incident Room is practically empty. Just a couple of uniformed officers sharing a joke by the water cooler, and D. I. Rick Johnson at a desk, surrounded by paper, head in his hands. All the other uniformed officers are either on another knock and note around the Lime Kiln estate, or searching the bins and crannies in a 400 yard radius. Leadengate was built 120 years ago, and is unsuited to the technological rigours of 21st century policing. The incident room is a cross between a local history society exhibition and a computer auction room. But staff knows the importance of having one hub, one place where all the information comes together. If a case is going to be closed quickly, the key connection usually has to be established within four or five days of the crime. The skill is to be able to see that key connection amidst the mountains of statements and data for what it is. But, so far, evidence is in short supply. No one was seen trying to gain access to Carl and Leanne Colhoun's flat. No one saw Leanne Colhoun until she ran screaming onto the lime kiln access deck. There is no sign of the murder weapon, which is possibly a narrow-bladed Stanley. No sign of the gauze and other materials that were used to tether and gag Carl Colhoun, and no eyes. Staff has read and reread the forensic report on the scene. It makes no sense to him. The scene was clean as a whistle, save the substances that leaked from Carl Colhoun. Residues of cleaning solutions were found on all handles, chair backs, door plates, and the bedstead. And on top of that, the killer had found the time to pose for and possibly take a photograph in the middle of the execution. If he is asked to believe that Leanne Colhoun did all this, staff cannot for the life of him determine why she would flee the scene screaming, leaving behind a handbag which contained a receipt from a supermarket that placed her out of her workplace close to the time of death. Staff sits down next to Johnson and waits for him to look up. Any joy with Tenerife? Deborah Bowker claims not to have been back here for over a year. I'm running checks with all the airlines, but my guess is she's telling the truth. And what did she say when you told her Carl Colhoun was dead? All she said was the bastard never sent Christmas presents anyway. Was she shocked? I couldn't say, maybe. I don't know. Well, if she wasn't shocked... I know, sir, I'm sorry, it just didn't register. Staff can see that Johnson is out on his feet. How's the new baby, Rick? He's great, sir. But there's three of them now in that bloody flat, and Becky's lost interest in even going out. But I can't afford anything bigger, no way. Staff thinks about what kind of a mess Johnson is in. Becky Johnson used to be a lawyer, pulling in twice what her husband brought home. She went back to work after the first two were born, Sean and Ricky. But after the third, young Charlie, she gave up. Once, Johnson joked they'd be better off if he was the one at home. But he hadn't laughed. Staff had asked why Becky hadn't gone back after Charlie, but Johnson had looked daggers at him, said... Is that your business? You don't own me. Get yourself off home, Staff says now. 
Give me Deborah Bowker's number and I'll call her. Ah, oh, there's too much to do. Take Becky and the kids down the park. And there's a favour you can do me. I'll call you later. Staff scrunches the note up and presses it into Johnson's hand. Looks round furtively as he walks away. When he reaches the door, Johnson calls out, Sir? Looking at the twenty-pound note Staff has slipped him. Get a takeaway and put the kids to bed early. Back in his office, Staff picks up a copy of the photograph, reads the lettering. See Justice Done. See justice done might mean kill the guilty. See justice done might mean protect the innocent. See justice done. Photograph it. The Kilburn house smells different. Marie has obviously burnt the lunch and been smoking her roll-ups. Harry has left his computer games strewn over the living room floor, but staff can't bring himself to be annoyed, possibly because of what he has in mind. He quickly tidies up and opens the front windows and the doors onto the back garden to get a draught going. Then gets down to business. Marie has left a note that she'll be back at six and will cook dinner, so staff texts her to say he'll be out. It is five o'clock now, and he goes straight upstairs to the guest room. He sits on the floor and takes stock of how her suitcase is packed before he systematically goes through her things. He tries not to feel bad about this. Marie has never asked him for help. They coped with the murder of their parents in different ways. Staff went off the rails, but put his money into property, and then joined the force. Within a few years, Marie had blown her inheritance on travel, drugs and bad relationships before falling pregnant with Harry. The father, an out-of-work session musician, lasted less than a year. Staff picks a meticulous ways with the suitcase, putting the clothes in one pile, her books and trinkets in another. It is not until he gets right to the bottom that he finds what he wants. A building society passbook shows that she has less than £200. Her bank account is overdrawn. There is also a clutch of unpaid bills, and he commits the billing address to memory. 26D St John's Road, Peckham. But there is nothing which bears the boyfriend's name. No joint names on any of her domestic contracts. He sighs and goes to the window looks up and down Shooter's Hill to check she's not on her way back. He surveys her gypsy life in miniature and kneels by the small stack of books. Virginia Woolf, Angela Carter and Tony Morrison. He flicks through the pages and on the inside cover of Beloved he finds what he wants. Inscribed in a self-consciously flowery hand is the name. Paolo Di Venuto. Summer 2007 Despite his taste in books, Di Venuto has a penchant for roughing up his women. Downstairs, a door slams and Staff leaps up. Well, calls Marie from downstairs. Shit, he says to himself, quickly repacking the case as best he can in the order he recalls. Papers first, then books and clothes. He drops her bras and knickers, and the hooks and eyes snag on each other, catch on his watch strap. His hands begin to shake, and he makes a mess of the penultimate layer, finishing off with singlet tops and a denim skirt. She is coming up the stairs, and Harry is clattering about in the room below. Will? He closes the suitcase, struggling with the lock as he hears her padding along the hallway. He slides the case back by the side of the bed and rushes to the window, begins to open it as the door is pushed open. Marie frowns, hands on hips. What the hell? Staff knows his only option is to fight fire with fire. For Christ's sake, Marie, 
Those roll-ups of yours stink the place out. Can't you smoke outside? This is our room. I'd appreciate... I'd appreciate it if you smoked outside, OK? If you don't want us here, there's other places I could go. Staff knows this is a lie. If there was anywhere, she'd be there. Look, you can stay as long as you want, you know that. She's wearing a short-sleeve Amnesty International T-shirt, and he can see where the foundation makeup has faded, failing to cover her bruises. He walks across to her, trying to be cool. He puts his hands on her shoulders. She feels fragile. He kisses her on her forehead and says softly into her hair, I'm sorry I came into your room. I won't do it again. She wraps her arms around his waist and he pats her back, the way he remembers his mother doing when they wouldn't go to sleep. Marvitz Builders Merchants, where Carl Colquhoun worked, is closing up for the day when staff gets there. Johnson should have done this visit, but staff needs a personal favour from his sergeant, and this is his idea of recompense. Staff has brought a photograph of Carl Colquhoun, but there's no need. The foreman of the timber section knows why he is there as soon as staff shows his warrant card. I was expecting a visit, he says. Do you usually shut at this time? This weather, there's only one place builders will be. They get rained off in winter and sunned off on days like these. My boys will be with them, no doubt. Staff looks around the deserted bays, piles of sawdust and chippings all over the floor, the smell of resin sweet in the thick air. He's a good worker, Colquhoun. Wouldn't have left the place in a state like this. The manager takes hold of a broom. How did he get on with your boys? says Staff. All right, till Ross Dennis came. Who's he? New lad. New car from the estate he lived on. And where might I find our friend Dennis? The manager has begun to sweep up and says, Pound to a penny will be in the rag. The ragamuffin? You know it? No, but I know someone who does. The landlord of the ragamuffin points a gnarled, badly reset finger in the direction of a tall, gangling, late-twenties man with lank hair and a sneering smile. Ross Dennis is in the far corner of the pub, leaning against the pool table with a young girl rubbed up against him. The ragamuffin would have been a good boozer at some point, until they knocked all the vaults and taprooms and snugs into one, and painted the walls blue and replaced the last beer pump for yet another brand of premium lager. There are more girls than men, drinking alcopops and showing their backsides with impossibly low trousers or obscenely high skirts. The men strut round with their pumped-up chests and shaven heads, and there is quite definitely something in the air. Staff sips his diet coke and watches Dennis. The girl shows her face and looks barely sixteen. It's a thin line, he thinks, that separates Dennis from his work colleague, Carl Colquhoun. He gets the landlord's attention again and nods to the pool table. Monday afternoon. Was Dennis in here? He's in most every afternoon. And Monday? He was here. Got in about half past four, five, I'd say. For how long? The landlord laughs. Till shut. Same old, less he pulls. He looks across at Dennis. Reckon he'll be having an early one today. He's a boy. And what about Rob? Rob Boxall. Rob's not been in for ages. He know Dennis, asked Staff. You'd best ask him that. I'm asking you. The landlord shrugs and picks up a glass from the glass washer tray, starts to wipe it dry. Across the room, 
Dennis must have said something lewd as the girl puts the bottle of blue fluorescence in her mouth. She pretends to be offended and punches him in the chest. He falls backwards on the table and she moves up against him so his knee is between her thighs. When he comes back upright, he puts a hand up a practically non-existent thin white cotton skirt and she kisses him. Staff decides enough is enough and by the time he gets to the table their heads are circling manically. She clocks Staff while she necks open-eyed with Dennis, pushing his hand away from whatever base they call it in these parts. Ross, says Staff, tapping him on the shoulder. What the fuck? Dennis looks up, a smear of lipstick all around his stubbled mouth. I'm D.I. Wagstaff. Just wanted a few words. If it's about that kid fiddler Calhoun, I say good riddance to bad shit. Staff looks at the girl, says, Shouldn't you be doing your homework? I've got ID, she says, playing with her streaked hair extensions. I'm sure there's a story behind that too. I could look into it if you want. Dennis is taller than Staff and a couple of mates have come across half laughing, half snarling, holding bottles. Staff's heart beats fast and his palms begin to sweat. Even after twenty years in the game, there are places where the law doesn't wash, people it doesn't know how to touch any more. On your way, he says to the girl. She looks at Dennis and he shrugs. As she gathers up her handbag and cigarettes, Dennis slaps her bottom. She laughs and runs her tongue around her lips. The fuck do you want? says Dennis. You done your job in the first place. No one would have needed to top that piece of shit. How do you know Colquhoun did what he was supposed to have done? says Staff. Everyone knew. Knew what? His last missus had to piss off out of the country to keep him off his own kids. And now they say his new missus can't see her own kids in case he starts giving them one. Fucking frag! You seem to know a lot about the victim. Victim? says Dennis. Give him a medal, I say. And anyway, I worked with him, didn't I? And you live round the corner from him. So fucking what? Do you know Leanne Colquhoun? He takes a swig from his bottle of Bex and says, I know a lot of women. How'd you expect me to keep track? Dennis is swaggering now and his mates are laughing, nudging closer still, forming a ring. What about Leanne's ex, Rob Boxall? You know him? Out of the corner of his eye, Staff can see Dennis's mates look away, drinking from their bottles. So ring now, bells. Just so you know, you're being watched. Put your filthy hands anywhere near that girl again and I'll have you for kiddie fiddling. She's a woman, you muppet, says Dennis. That'll be your burden of proof, says Staff. The fuck you say, says Dennis, like he's wrestling with algebra. Staff has had enough. He turns on his heel and pushes his way out of the pub. When he gets to his car, he leans against the offside wing, sees the girl in the bright white light of a fried chicken queue opposite. Ross Dennis comes out of the rag. The girl waves at him, but Dennis blanks her. He has a face like thunder, and putting his head down, he strides off up the high street. Unsure whether to follow him, Staff feels suddenly nervous, as if he might be under-equipped. But then a car blazes towards him. It blares its horn and swerves towards his car, and Staff has to throw himself on the bonnet. He rolls onto the pavement as the car screeches to a halt just yards away and a youth jumps out, shouting, What the fuck? Staff gets up off the pavement, brushes himself down. 
The youth from the car walks towards staff, leaning backwards and swaggering with his pelvis pushed out, low-slung baggy jeans and a sideways baseball cap. As he walks, he talks, jabbing two fingers towards staff as if he's holding a gun. You in the fucking road, man, what you doing? We seen you, man, know your game. Staff takes a deep breath and reaches into his inside pocket for his warrant card. The youth flinches, reaches into his own back pocket, and with a fizzing noise he releases the cat to a flick knife. Staff holds out his warrant card and says, I'm police, you fucking prick. Now drop that knife and put your nose against the wall. He doesn't know how this will pan out. Can't be sure he can pull it off. You can never be sure. And, true enough, the ringleader looks back towards his mates in the car. Staff knows he only has one chance. Four of them pile out of the car, so Staff takes a step toward the youth and launches himself, going for the arm with a knife. He takes hold of the weapon and feels a bright seam of pain open up along his arm. He twists the youth's wrist and sees his face come towards him, snarling. Staff shoves him into the wall, drops him to the floor. The youth squeals and the blade drops to the pavement, metallic, smeared with Staff's blood. Staff puts his boot on the blade and stands back as the chav curls into a ball, saying, Fucking bully, I'll do you! Fucking bully, don't hit me no more! The ringleader looks daggers at the four mates who have stopped dead in their tracks. Then, to the gathering crowd, he says to no one in particular, You see that? You see that fucking copper pulling a knife on me? Staff bends down, picks up the knife, and as he does, he sees blood streaming off the end of his fingers. His suede jacket is torn, and the pain begins to kick and spread. He grimaces, blade in hand, and the crowd takes a step back as he puts a foot on the youth's chest. The teenage girl comes out of the fried chicken shop, shouting, He's been looking for a fight, that copper! Been in the rag trying to start my boyfriend, he was! In the near distance, a police siren winds up its wail, and Staff takes a deep breath, holds his wrist as tight as he can. He anticipates the allegations, the audience with Pennington and all the paperwork. He wishes he had gone to Bill Bowell and can practically smell the sea air as he watches the blood pool around his feet. He feels fainter and fainter as the adrenaline begins to abate. Tuesday evening You should go to the hospital with this, sir, says Josie tying the bandage around Staff's wrist. How did you get on with tracking Leanne's ex down? Rob Boxall. He's doing two years in Belmarsh for dealing MDMA and C-meth. Been in since May, so he's off the hook. You better get someone to pay him a visit. See if he knows Ross Dennis. Sure, sir. Josie is examining Staff's arm. Still holding his hand, she says... That youth outside the rag. What about him? He's saying you went at him with the knife. His mates are backing him up and so's that girl. Have we got an ID on him? We've got a couple. Josie sits down on the opposite side of his desk and leans forward with her elbows on the desk, her face resting on the backs of her hands. She raises her eyebrows and says... He said to say, Jadis knows. What's that supposed to mean? Josie leans back in the chair. She looks at him long, hard, quizzical. What's wrong? You should be on a beach or up a mountain, and here you are with your arm all bandaged up and some gangland fatwa out on you. Let me buy you a drink. I can't do that. It's a case of you won't do it, not can't. Thanks for the lecture. Don't mention it, she says, standing up and walking out of the office. As she gets to the door, she leans back into the room, says, 
If anybody ever needed a drink, and she laughs. Staff gestures for Josie to close the door behind her. As she does, he dials Johnson's home number. Rick, he says. Just going out for the takeaway, sir. You can do me a favour, says Staff. Aha, says Johnson. I want you to go down to Peckham. Scare the living shit out of a lowlife called Paolo di Venuto. For doing what? For being a bastard. Can you be more precise? He's seeing my sister. Scare him off with anything and everything you can think of. Benefit fraud, immigration, dealing or possession. You'll get the drift when you see him. And see how he responds to an allegation of ABH. Just say you've had an anonymous complaint. I don't suppose there's any point asking why I'm doing this. 26D St John's Road, says Staff, hanging up, punching in Deborah Bowker's number in Tenerife. As it rings, he writes himself a note to get the Sea Justice Done photograph remastered, to investigate his every detail to get the text take on the hood's material, any labelling on the clothes, and match the hair in the photo to any samples taken from the scene and from Leanne Colhoun. A woman answers the phone. Mrs Bowker? Deborah Bowker? says Staff. Miss? I'm D.I. Wagstaff from Leadengate C.I.D., I spoke to one of your colleagues. Staff leans back in his chair, puts his feet up on the bottom drawer of his desk. On the other end of the line, he can hear children playing. I just wanted to be sure about your movements over the past few weeks. I told your colleague, she sighs. Look, if I was you, I'd have me at the top of your list, but I can assure you I had nothing to do with it much as it would have pleased me to see the bastard suffer. What do you know about Rob Boxall? Nothing. And what about Ross Dennis, Mrs Bowker? Miss? Staff sits up quickly. He scrawls a note. Deborah Colhoun, check passports and airlines. I apologise... As a matter of interest, when did you stop being called Deborah Colhoun? The minute I slammed the door on him. But when did your divorce come through? Ten months. Are we done? If you remember anything about Ross Dennis, let me know. In the background, a child screams out, and staff says, oh, We're done. For now. How's his mum taking it? Maureen, says Deborah. There is another child screaming in the background. I have to go. Give her my love if you speak to her. And tell her Danielle and Kimberly say hi. Staff buzzes through to the incident room and tells Josie to get onto the airlines again and check the name Deborah Colhoun. Then he tells her to pay Carl's mother a visit. Don't push her. Just get her talking about Carl and about the first wife too, if you can. Softly, softly. And tell her that Danielle and Kimberly say hi. Tell her they send their love. Josie knows that Maureen Colhoun is 61 years old and has been widowed for three years. Her husband died of sclerosis of the liver, but they'd been separated for some time. Carl Colhoun was her only son. Maureen shows Josie into the front room. It's a museum piece of how somebody on a budget might conjure a model of Edwardian comfort, with its fat veneered furniture and a floral tapestry three-piece. A busy, patterned carpet of purples and greens, a whiff of Mr Sheen. She fusses over Josie, running off to make tea and coming back with biscuits on a doily plate, sitting on the edge of her chair, knees together and hands clasped. 
It is about Carl, Mrs Colquhoun. Uh, call me Maureen. I'm very sorry about what happened to him. Mrs Colquhoun nods earnestly, hanging on to Josie's every word. We're obviously trying our best to find out what happened. And one of the things is... Well, I'd like to know what sort of a man he was, Maureen. What sort of a son he was. Josie takes out her digital recorder and says, Do you mind if I tape us? Maureen shakes her head slowly. She looks nonplussed. Does it matter what I say? Josie leans forward, holds Maureen's hands and says, Go on, tell me anything you want. About Carl or Deborah or Leanne. Anything, Maureen. They said he had been drinking. When the police came round, they said that he had been killed and it was murder. And when I asked who they thought it was, they didn't want to say, but they said my son was inebriated. Well, I know that couldn't be. He's never touched a drop, not a drop. He's done wrong, I know he has. And there's things I can't turn a blind eye to no matter how I try. But I won't believe he'd been drinking. I won't. Josie thinks it curious that a mother might become so agitated about a son who drinks, when he's also a father who very probably abused his own children. Do you miss the children, Maureen? Your grandchildren? How do you know I don't see them? Well, they're in Tenerife. Maureen's face goes tight and she purses her lips. A hard look comes easily to her eyes and she blinks something away. He didn't tell you, did he? She took them all the way over there. Mary, Mother of God, all the way over there. They say hello and send their love, says Josie, watching staff's message exert its power on the smiling face of Maureen Colquhoun. Poor Deborah. God bless her. Oh, those children. Those beautiful children. You say Carl never drank. Never a drop, and nor would you. Nor would you if you'd had his father. The smile has gone again now. It got out of hand, so terribly out of hand. She lets go of Josie and puts her hands between her knees in a downturn prayer. He always said it was a sad man who drank in the house. But when I had Carl, he brought whiskey into the house. He'd come home from the pub and drink the bottle, the whole bottle. And then he'd go upstairs. Carl would cry as soon as he smelt the stench of drink coming. When you say... He went upstairs, Maureen. There's nothing I could do. If someone really wanted to hurt Carl, to take him to a dark place, they would make him drunk. Is that right, Maureen? Oh, yes, that would be right. And if someone got him drunk against his will, they would have to know him quite well. Not many people knew about his past, Maureen. He didn't talk about it much. Why would he talk about it? Josie wants to stay longer, wants to talk about normal things with Maureen, but she decides she will send a counsellor round. It's something she agrees with staff about. There's nothing to be gained by playing the amateur psychologist. The day is ending and the heat begins to lift away from London's tar and glass. Staff puts down his mobile, registering what Josie has told him about Maureen Colquhoun and her son, the victim. He switches back and forth from Rat Run to Rat Run, south and west to Queen's Terrace. He remembers it the first time. When he bought the flat, his mother and father were not long dead, and the weekends there were long, bleak, lonely affairs. Staff double parks and uses a beanie hat on top of the dash to wedge a parking permit up against the windscreen. 
he flips the boot and takes out his thirty-year-old white plastic Adidas hold-all. He feels the twinge of a sad and happy memory and closes his eyes, takes a deep breath and exhales in five equally measured orbs. Sometimes he thinks it's bullshit, but sometimes it works, and now, turning the key in the door, he gets a nostalgic glow. The Queen's Terrace flat smells lived in, and although the tenant has left a few things and not hoovered or even put the last meal's dishes away, staff texts the managing agent to say they can return the tenant's deposit. He sits in the beaten-up old club chair in the bay window and leans back. He eyes up the cornice mouldings and the ceiling rows, thinks maybe it's time to move back into this one. It would certainly keep him and Marie from each other's throats. He thinks about young Harry being dragged from pillar to post. Staff goes through to the bathroom, takes out his running gear from the Adidas bag and runs the shower. It's what he's done since he first joined the force. A hot shower first to get him sweating, then a run and a cold shower when he gets back. He remembers the first time Jessop came round, saw what he's doing. It's like an exorcism, he had said, and he laughed. The water jets down hard on his scalp and shoulders, and he turns the heat up a notch so it's almost scalding him. He scrubs and scrubs with the soap, the smell of coal tar getting thicker and thicker, the steam getting more and more dense. As he scrubs, he plats over and over in different orders the events of the last few days. Josie rations out a glass of Semillon Chardonnay from a box in the fridge and takes a peek at the roasting medley of peppers, courgettes and whole baby carrots, drizzled with olive oil and sucking up the essence of two bulbs of garlic. Her mouth waters, and she sets out two pork chops, seasons them and checks her watch, skips across the room and kneels into the diminishing space where her CD player sits on the floor, under the small window that juts into the angle of the roof. It took a leap of faith in every scrimped and saved halfpenny she could muster. But three years ago, with some help from her parents down in Hastings, Josie Chancellor bought this studio flat in the roof space of an old, unrefurbished house near Victoria. Even now, she just about covers the interest on the mortgage, and once a quarter she feels her pulse race when she sees what kind of debt she is in with the Alliance and Leicester. This is the first proper date she has had since she transferred to Leadengate six months ago. And although it is David Pulford who is coming round, it's not him that she is thinking about. Believe nothing of what you hear and only half of what you see, is what her father used to say. What would he make of D.I. Will Wagstaff? She sits on the floor with her feet tucked up under her bottom and sips from her glass questioning her motives for saying yes to Pulford so readily. She curses herself for being so stupid as to invite him round for a meal. The intercom buzzes, and she drains her glass, stooping as she stands so as not to bang her head on the sloping ceiling. She pauses by the intercom's crackling speaker, lets it buzz again. She sighs, then turns off the oven and puts the chops into a cereal bowl puts a side plate on top and places the covered meat in the fridge. The intercom buzzes a third time, long and hard, and she presses the button to receive. Hi, Josie, it's me, says Pulford. Wait there. What? I didn't have a chance to get anything in. Let's go out. She checks in her purse. Three pounds fifty. Nothing in the bank and two days till payday. Pounding away from street to square and onto the Brompton Road, Star feels the sweat coming faster and faster. He closes his ears to everything but the shock of the road thudding up from his feet, along his thighs and up into his torso and fast-beating heart. He's too old for this, but he catches sight of the park on the other side of Knightsbridge, and Jay canters through the traffic, 
up onto the sand track bridleway. His muscles burn, his lungs roast. The sound gets duller, deeper. He can see there is one truth that governs everything that happens under the blood-red sky of the city. He knows that this truth is stitched together by the actions of millions of people living alongside each other. Everything is connected, and everything can be understood. Even the clumsy or haphazard criminal will have a rationale. There will be a pattern to their behaviour. The trouble is, the more evidence you accumulate, the more obscure the reasons can become. Dennis or Rob Boxall? Leanne or Deborah Bowker? Or someone not yet uncovered? Whoever did it knew Carl Colhoun's darkest secret. Staff looks up into the dusking expanse of the park. He takes a long, arcing U-turn by the Serpentine Lake and heads back towards the Knightsbridge lights. He soon has the streets beneath him again, hammering down towards Victoria. After six, seven minutes, he accelerates into a sprint, full pelt, and pulls himself up quickly, hands on hips. His shins are splinting and the sweat comes thick and fast, prickling his scalp, shallowing in the small of his back. It has been three years since his last cigarette, but Staff feels a nicotine craving in his lungs, burning deep, so he straightens himself from his haunches, falls into a painful jog. He says, persevere, persevere, over and again, feeling too old for this. End of Disc 2